My name is Edgar Blatchford and I was born in Nome during territorial times. The population of Alaska at the time was about 100,000 uh, people. We were one of the last families, as I remember it, in Nome, Alaska to have a working dog team. This is before snow machines, before snow machines. My dad was a construction worker and every summer he went off to a construction job, as I did uh, later on. Um, but we were subsistence. Uh, hunters and, and mostly hunters, not really fishermen, hunters and gatherers. And we lived on the outskirts of Nome and we had a working dog team. I mean, this was a working dog team. They weren't uh, Iditarod dogs, you know, that run, 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 run. These were dogs that pulled and pulled and pulled. The lifestyle I had in Nome, Alaska was, was feeding dogs, getting water for dogs, uh, chasing down dogs to tie them, tie them up, was uh, hunting. In 1960, the family moved to Seward. I went to grade school and high school in Seward. And after high school, I went off to a small school here in Anchorage, uh, Alaska Methodist University, now called APU, Alaska Pacific University, then to the University of Washington School of Law. And then I returned to Alaska. And we went from, uh, you know, having a dog team uh, outside, you know, and uh, a, a honey bucket and hauling your water uh, into modern conveniences. And, but I remember uh, when we flew down from Nome and then landed in McGrath and Anchorage and then uh, drove down to Seward. And it was quite different because Nome was an uh, Eskimo community and Seward was not, an, not a native community. Uh, you had streets, you had flush toilets. Uh, Seward was a good community. It was a, a progressive community uh, as Alaska communities uh, were. And uh, it, was a, it was kind of a fun time. But you know, in my introduction to uh, the Alaska Native claims comes from this uh, Seward point of view. You know, watching it uh, from a distance. You know, the, it was most everything was happening here in Anchorage or Fairbanks or Juneau. I, I was in Seward, and I would read the old Anchorage Times. It was at that time it was called the Anchorage Daily Times, and this big battle going on in Alaska with the natives. You know, these natives filing claim to Alaska, and they were stopping the construction of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. It was, it was a, kind of the, the news stories weren't uh, warm stories, and uh, uh, I teach media history, and, and I would say that the stories were, uh, would in our day would say, hostile newspaper writing. But the natives had claimed um, all of Alaska, uh, parts of British Columbia, uh, the Yukon Territory, and going into further into Canada, uh, huge areas of Alaska and, and Canada were claimed by Aboriginal groups uh, here. So uh, I became aware of the Native Claims Settlement efforts uh, in the mid-1960s. In, in fact, the first Alaska Native, educated Alaska Native, was Willie Hensley, you know, the first Alaska Native I ever met who had a college degree. And I followed uh, the land claims battle through the 60s and into the 70s. In the, uh, 1969, I went to Alaska Methodist University and there was a class uh, taught by Bob Goldberg. Bob Goldberg was the son of Arthur Goldberg who was doing pro bono work for the Alaska Federation of Natives. Bob Goldberg's so father, Arthur Goldberg, was a former Supreme Court Justice and former Secretary of Labor under President Kennedy uh, and was uh, very uh, supportive of the, of the Native land claims. And uh, I was in that first big, big group of Alaska Natives to enter a university system. There were a whole bunch of us. I think there were 29, and that was a huge number back in uh, the late 1960s. And we had been recruited uh, by uh, AMU because uh, what they saw around the horizon or down the street or up the mountain was that there would be a settlement act at some point in time. And so uh, I, I took a class from Bob Goldberg, and it was Alaska Native Claims. Uh, the Native Claims was another year, maybe two years, uh, into the future. And we started with land selections, and uh, Bob Goldberg would have these big maps in front of us, and we would look at lands that we would like to claim. Uh, you know, or were claimed, but you know, you'd have to take these big claims and then you'd have to narrow them down. And on what basis do you claim the land? Do you claim the land on the basis of traditional uh, use, uh, subsistence use, or economic potential? And so we'd make these decisions in, during a class period. But, but I, that's when I became fully aware of the, of the Settlement Act. I was at uh, Atwood Hall uh, when uh, 
the, uh, the convention when they uh, accepted or, uh, or ratified the uh, congressional bill, you know, and uh, when Richard Nixon had signed uh, the Settlement Act. Uh, and that was a huge uh, gathering of Alaska Natives, or I don't know, probably a thousand uh, Alaska Natives in and out. I think there were about 500 delegates, but there were a lot of Alaska Natives from all over the state. So, so you know, I became uh, aware of this mainly because I, I, I would read these newspaper stories and see these pictures of John Borbridge and Willie Hensley, Evan Hobson, uh, uh, Martin Moore, you know, the big names of the 1960s. Uh, Roy, uh, Roy Hundorf had not, had not yet become a big name like he later did in the 1970s. Uh, Cecil Barnes was a big name. Uh, Maury Thompson was big, but he was uh, working in Washington, D.C. at the time. Uh, and, and there were a lot of uh, uh, people. It was just it was fascinating to watch because what, what you saw was this um, group of uneducated people, you know, coming for, uh, forward and basically saying that this is our land. And there was such hostility in Alaska coming from uh, various groups. The natives are stopping development of Alaska. Uh, the natives won't know what to do with all this money. Uh, the natives, you know, they don't uh, like each other. You know, the Indians don't like the Eskimos. The Eskimos don't like the Aleuts. And nobody likes each other, so they'll never be able to work together. And this will just all fail. And they're stopping the construction of the, of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. So my introduction to uh, the Native Claim Settlement Act was uh, during a period of hostility, and um, uh, I consider Seward to be my hometown now. You know, and and uh, Seward uh, was predominantly a non-native community, as Anchorage was. There were very few P uh, Alaska Natives in Anchorage. You know, which is now there's about sixteen, seventeen thousand Alaska Natives, perhaps more Alaska Natives in Anchorage, but there weren't that many Alaska Natives in Anchorage, and uh, very few Alaska Natives in Seward. So, uh, and my introduction uh, to the Native Claims was through uh, Alaska Methodist University and the efforts made by uh, people like Bob Goldberg. Uh, and, you know, I met Willie Hensley when he was a, a state representative. You know, he attended a function. Uh, there was another person by the name of Adam John. Uh, he was from the, uh, the Atna region, now the Atna region. Uh, and they would come and they would talk uh, to our, our classes and then we would attend events. In 19, um, I think it was 1970, maybe 1972, Don Wright, as president of the, uh, of the AFN, had invited the National Congress of American Indians uh, to Alaska. And I was president of the uh, Alaska Methodist University uh, Club, which we called ANZO, Alaska Native Students Organization. And I testified in, I think, 1969, 1970, before a committee down at the old Sidney Lawrence Auditorium about uh, you know, an Alaska Native claims and what, what we were pushing for. And I used the words fair, just, and equitable uh, settlement of Alaska Native claims. And then, of course, I, I pushed for the construction of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, but to be built in an environmentally uh, safe manner. Uh, and, you know, there was hostility outside the Sydney Lawrence Auditorium. I think all of us have seen the pictures of uh, Charlie Edwards and Etuk, you know, outside and other people who were protesting uh, the, what they... Uh, felt was the land taking or the land giveaway uh, to the uh, uh, non-natives without a, a fair and just and equitable settlement of native land claims. So my introduction uh, to the uh, native land claims was in the mid-1960s through the newspaper and uh, from the reaction from non-natives and uh, the hostility towards Alaska Natives. It's a very difficult time to be an Alaska Native in the 1960s. Uh, very difficult because if you stood up uh, and fought for Alaska Natives, uh, you weren't admired uh, uh, and by some Alaska Natives because you were kind of rocking the boat and, you know, things we were comfortable and, you know, things were looking uh, better. Uh, we were a new state. We were going into the 1970s. Perhaps a pipeline would be built. Perhaps there would be jobs for, uh, for more Alaska Natives. And, but uh, when I look back, you know, most Alaska Natives I believe, lived in rural Alaska. I mean, uh, they lived in the villages along the Yukon, the Bering Sea Coast, Southeast Alaska communities, the Yukon River. So it was a very, very different Alaska. And, and I'd look at these native organizations. Uh, native organizations you would have, uh, you would have the elders here, and they would know what they wanted, and, the, and this, uh, uh, very few of them were comfortable speaking English, so you, you would speak Eskimo or you would speak uh, Athabascan or, or Tlingit, and, uh, and then above that you would have the few Alaska Natives who had gone off to college were in college. Uh, like uh, 
uh, John Sackett, like uh, Byron Malott. You know, they were coming up through the ranks. Uh, and they were the ones who were uh, forceful and they understood parliamentary procedure and they, they understood the, the tremendous challenge that Alaska Natives faced in the 19, uh, 1960s and the, uh, early 1970s. So my introduction uh, to Alaska Natives was, uh, was a period when uh, there weren't uh, warm feelings for Alaska Natives because Alaska Native organizations were stopping uh, this economic potential, the development of Alaska. Uh, and uh, I think uh, with, with the people of the 1960s, I think they, they were courageous because they were fighting the status quo. They were standing up and they were speaking. And, uh, and when I get back, when we go further after the Settlement Act into the 1970s, uh, what, what I saw was that many of them were treated so disrespectfully because we, we now went from political organizations with a social agenda, nonprofit, loosely... Uh, uh, organized organizations, native organizations, uh, like the Cook Inlet Native Association, or the Bering Straits Native Association, or the Arctic Slope Native Association, where you know the leaders just kind of rose up through because they were good at articulating ideas.